thing of blended learning, like how can MOOC be an addition to on-site learning? So at the moment we are fully virtually, uh, most of the Biro uses it for uh, marketing tools. I think uh, Prometheus and Kepo Polytechnical Institute has these strategic ideas of how to implement it on on-site learning. So maybe your ideas, Radmila, and also from Sandy on how to add um, something through MOOCs to on-site learning in place when we see finally each other again. Mm -hmm. We have already started it in uh, before the pandemic because we blended in some of our MOOCs uh, in educational process. Uh, at our CS50, we have um, teachers who blended this at, as rotation classes. They have lectures uh, online. It was uh, our MOOCs that they were using as a lectures and practical part of the course, they take it uh, offline in classes. And uh, a response from our students were great. They were like, oh, that's awesome. I can go to the park and I can listen to the lecture in the park or I can have a tea in the night or I can have a coffee in the morning and I can listen to my favorite lecture online. And then I can go and share my knowledge with my partners in the class and I can prepare some practical part. And I think uh, it was working great before the pandemic. And I think we will go there after the pandemic as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree to that. Like um, we are actually right now, yeah, starting to, to implement the strategy like we are still discussing like how will our education on campus look like after the pandemic how much digital education will there be because there are professors of course who prefer uh, that kind of lecture like it's very comfortable to be able to give it from anywhere and to just ah I can just post the video uh, one a few days in advance and then I don't even have to be there when the lecture actually is and um, other professors say, I want to get back to on-site learning as soon as possible, and I hate the digital way. Um, and yeah, what we are trying to do is, like, okay, where is the digital way actually better? Um, and what do the students um, um, yeah, also like the most? How, how do they work best? Um, because the thing is that, for example, students who are in their first or second semester, um, they were doing really hard. They had a really hard time <laughs> to, to learn from I totally home, to agree. Not, not having the real student experience, not getting in touch with the other students. And when we have like normal Moodle e-learning courses, there often is not that many interactions. So, um, the, yeah, the way we do MOOCs could actually give some benefits to that to offer them more opportunities to interact with their fellow students um, to do group assessments in an online way um, uh, I think that would be something yeah really worth to try um, and I believe that in the end we will have yeah a mixture right we will have uh, some kind of middle ground having on campus but also having a digital resource that we um, yeah, continue using right now that we, now that we learned how to do it, uh, and it would be a shame if we didn't, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, our exchange now is international German Ukrainian. I know that MOOC is international phenomenon, and also um, Bayreuth MOOCs are very much pointing on the international sphere. And also, Radmila told us that they have a very wide audience. Uh, from different countries. So, um, Sandy, I have a question to you. Are there any specific points where you should look at when you're constructing a MOOC for international target group because there are different styles of learning and teaching? Um, mm -hmm. Very true. Um, yeah, so far we see that um, a lot of people um, who are participating in our MOOCs are from the US and in the UK. Um, that's because um, that's where edX uh, yeah, has the most participants in the first place. And what's really interesting to see is that we always um, give a survey in the end of the course asking, how did you come to know of this course? Like, how did you find us? And 
uh, the majority of people says I scrolled through the courses on edX and this is how I saw it. It's not the marketing that we do, unfortunately, not yet. Uh, it's mostly the marketing that edX does. So that's why we reach uh, the people in those regions better. Um, and um, yet having that in mind, um, I think the, the approach is a, it, a rather American one. Or having to say, uh, like, a, a lot of interactive, this is why we use video a lot, this is why we try to implement gamification a lot, because this is how the trend, where the trend is going in America as well and in the UK. And uh, Radmila, you mentioned that um, you have audience also outside of Ukraine, so I was wondering is that uh, Ukrainian diaspora, so which is connected to Ukrainian higher education institutions, um, and also, I think, the other way around, so not only connecting the diaspora with internet, with Ukrainian university, uh, is it true that you, through MOOCs it would be potentially connecting Ukrainian university students with a wider audience, um, with a wider um, experience also outside of the country without leaving the country? Yeah, we have a lot of uh, our diaspora as our listeners, as our students, and as well we have uh, courses in different languages. Mm -hmm. We have courses in Russian. Uh, these courses are for former republics of Soviet Union. They you know Russian, and I know that the Russian is uh, one of the most important languages in Europe right now. And a lot of people who are living outside of Ukraine, uh, who left Ukraine at some point, they are listening to our courses in Russian. It's not a lot, but we have um, some of them. They have Ukrainian subtitles or English subtitles. And also we have a couple of courses in English, not a lot, but we have a couple of them. It's courses for those who need to, to understand how they can enroll to a different universities outside of Ukraine. And these courses we've prepared in English. They have Ukrainian subtitles, but they are in English. And uh, but uh, the majority of our target audience uh, outside of Ukraine is diaspora, of course. And uh, we have a lot of feedback from them. A lot of different parts: uh, Canada, of course, Argentina, of course, uh, Australia. And uh, they uh, uh, wrote to us a lot of. Um, feedback materials and how they are studying in our courses, how it's important for them to stay connected to Ukraine, to stay connected to their roots. And uh, of course, I think that the next step for us is to create courses not only in English or in Russian and Ukrainian as well, but also in different European languages and uh, to try it with our colleagues outside of Ukraine, because we can work as a platform as edX works, we can uh, bring our platform to other countries to share our technical support and uh, to share our uh, amazing audience, both in Ukraine and outside of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Uh, that makes sense and also think is a very good strategic goal for the future. Um, uh, Sandy mentioned uh, the potential of doing MOOCs together in international teams. So I know that Mila is already working with uh, international university, uh, mainly through translation, but maybe both of you could give insights uh, what you already do with international uh, corporations and how is your outlook in future? How do you want to extend? And of course, we will carry on our exchange, uh, hopefully in second phase of uh, Lenopolis project between both of you to have these kind of strategic talks. And also I would like to give you the, and ask the opportunity to meet in person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can, um, as you know, our MOOC project is still very young and when it actually came to roll, there was the pandemic, so it was really hard um, to develop, for example, also do shootings uh, in, in another country, having those relationships developed, but um, what we did so far is we um, worked with our gateway, gateway offices, we have gateway offices in Australia, um, in France and in China, 
and we um, they helped us, for example, uh, in the market marketing and communication sector. Um, and um, in the future, we'd like to go there more and uh, um, have, having produced more MOOCs with them together. Um, especially again in the field of new materials, we have a department in Australia who is working very closely uh, together with us, and we'd love to, um, yeah. Yeah, have them take more part in the future books that we do. And as for us, we are working uh, together with American universities. A lot of American universities are our partners uh, when we are translating their courses. We have uh, such um, agreement with Harvard University, as I've mentioned earlier, with their computer science faculty department, the big department they have on that. Also, we are working with Columbia University and with Pennsylvania University. And of course, uh, the main part of our collaboration is MIT uh, Learning Laboratory they have. They're amazing. They have amazing team and uh, they are working on gamification as well and uh, they are working on courses design and design thinking and it's great to collaborate with them but I think our next step is to work with European universities more because we haven't any partners in Europe and I think it's a next step for us mm -hmm. to develop some collaboration Collaboration in Europe. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can also add that um, edX um, al always offers their partners to to make the connections between edX partners. So, for example, if we uh, when we were looking into uh, the positioning of the nutrition and health MOOC, uh, they immediately suggested we already have the University of Wageningen who is doing MOOCs in that area. Would you be interested in a cooperation with them? So they support this kind of relationship between edX partners. And this is definitely something we want to look into as well. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you very much for these international insights. Um, we discussed the question early in our preparatorial meetings, uh, um, which could be like the final uh, question to our meeting uh, today. So uh, you put so much effort uh, into it, into producing MOOC, uh, both of you. Is it worth? How does it pay off for you? Um, and what's your top tip for anyone who wants to start doing his or her own MOOC? Radmila, do you want to start on this one? <laughs> uh, I think Cindy will agree with me that it's a huge amount of work. It's uh, three, uh, six, nine, even 12 months. I have courses we produce for two years right now mm -hmm. and it's uh, a lot of work and uh, I think when is this work is done it's amazing feeling. You are uh, feeling like it's, uh, I don't know, you put something in space <laughs> as for me. It's, uh, we have a rocket and it's already launched because uh, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of uh, shootings, a lot of preparation, a lot of testing, but it's worth it. I think it's worth it because when you see that 2,000, 3,000, 10,000, 100,000 as we have at CS50 have enrolled, it's amazing. These people have, uh, they have uh, this uh, amazing opportunity to learn and we have this opportunity to give this knowledge to them. And this is amazing, of course. Uh, but I think uh, my uh, most common advice in this area, when you start to work with um, MOOCs, you need to understand how much time you have for it. Mm -hmm. Because if you have no time, don't start. But when you have time, you have, uh, I don't know, drive, you're dr driven by this uh, idea, you need to do it, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, agreed, definitely. Um, I mean, from the ideal perspective, uh, the, our ideal goal is to provide this education to people from everywhere. We definitely achieve that when we have people from 90 and more countries participating in the MOOC. It's just a great feeling and you say, okay, the MOOC is actually getting out there, the people are doing it and they enjoy it. And it's a really big reward for what you do. Um, what I mentioned earlier about the financial sustainability, this is something we have to work on because we want to keep the MOOCs free. We don't want to make people pay for it. And uh, so what's, your, what's our business model? And who pays? Because we had 
to actually pay for our membership on edX in the first place. And it was a lot of money, actually. Um, and um, how do we refinance uh, this kind of membership? Um, and how we, yeah do we become sustainable in the future this is something that really worries me and this is something that okay is it really worth it like spending a lot a lot of money for those many people who are working on it um and then the the um return on investment is not that high right now and it's not it's not an official goal like it's not supposed to supposed to be like that i know other universities who decided to go for future learner other platforms who give you more the opportunity to actually get your refunds <laughs> and, and really make money with the moves um, that was not our intention. That's why we went for edX because we have this ideal goal of making it free and um, and we have uh, the support by the um, government. That's great. But um, in the future, it won't be enough. Um, so, yeah, um, I can't give a definite answer to that question. Unfortunately, I think it's something worth keeping. I think we should keep doing this because it's um, I believe MOOCs are an essential part of the yes, learning strategy of tomorrow. This is how people will learn online with digital devices, on mobile devices, uh, from everywhere. Um, we should keep doing it, but how exactly, with what kind of business model, with what kind of strategy we do it, we'll have to see. So uh, thank you very much again, both of you. So it was very inspiring and uh, motivating also uh, to listen uh, to you. Um, unfortunately, uh, in time of uh, 